All right, so finally, yay! For real, finally. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so what's the most pressing thing on your mind right now? Um, well, so there's, I'll tell you there, there's some good news. You know, I called you, uh, I don't know, maybe a week ago or something and I, or and I told you kind of what was going on and then I texted you and I was like, not in the right mind because I had received word from my medical board representative that I had been recommended for full medical board for the Air Force to try and fight to stay in, you know. Like I met with my VA, the Veterans Affairs Administration. I met with my rep yesterday because I have to go through the claims process so that in the event that the informal board, um, if they decide that I'm not fit for duty, then it goes over to the disability rating board from the VA and that's where I'll get my disability rating. And that's for anything, any kind of medical problem that I have incurred since I entered the military, so all the way back to 2014, uh, June. Is that where they determine whether you're eligible for disability? Yeah, but I'm, I, yeah, like, you know, I met with her yesterday, and I'm really hoping that if I do get discharged that uh, I hit that 30% mark because that means I get medically retired, which means I walk around almost as if I served for 20 years. So I get a stipend for the rest of my life. I get to enjoy the commissary and the BX for the rest of my life. I get full health care coverage, access to medicine, that kind of stuff. Um, and there's some really cool opportunities. Um, like they provide uh, education benefits so I can, get, like I can get a master's degree through the VA and that kind of stuff. But the goal is to not get discharged. The goal is to actually go in and, and, and you know, fight for my career. Um, if the informal board does come back, there's two options. It can come back with dis or discharge, recommend discharge, and then they'll recommend some kind of disability. Or they can say return to duty. That means the whole process is over. I go back to living, doing my life as normal. If they do come back with a discharge, then I can say, no, I don't agree. And then I appeal that to the formal board. If the decision comes back and say early, or I'm sorry, late April, I have 10 days to decide whether or not I agree with that. As soon as you submit the appeal, um, it's usually about 10 days before you go to San Antonio to Randolph Air Force Base and you spend five days down there where you actually uh, are provided with legal counsel for, for, through the uh, Office of Airmen's Counsel because the medical board is an uh, actual formal board almost like a courtroom. Um, and you can, you essentially plead your case uh, with your lawyer and then the three physicians and then you wait for their decision and if that comes back they can come back with a return to duty or they can come back with a uh, discharge recommendation if they come back with discharge recommendation you can appeal it one last time and that's to the secretary of the air force her counsel and her could always say yes or no we don't we don't concur and then if you do get returned to duty in any of the process living with hiv in the military is not uh, it's not like easy peasy because um, you still get what's called an assignment limitation code, meaning I'm deployable with a waiver. Uh, I can go anywhere with a waiver. And then the anywhere is kind of got an asterisk because there are still a few uh, countries you can't go to. Um, and mostly that's, cons that's, that's located in central command, um, which encompasses all of the Middle East because there are still 18 countries that don't allow entrance to their country um, if you are HIV positive. I mean, that speaks to how far we still have to go with everything. I mean, if you think about it, most of the world followed, United States actually had a ban on travel um, up until 2010 for those living with HIV. Um, it was so, I mean, really and truly the U.S. has- As recently as 2010? As recently as under, is under President Obama. So we've made a lot of, the, and the world kind of followed suit um, after we did that. But I mean, that just shows you how recent though things are still in place. And I, I think that I think that speaks to a bigger issue, which is still the stigma of HIV. There's nothing medically that bars me from service in the military. The medical community says, "Hey, this kid has HIV, but his viral load is zero. His CD4 count is over 800. Really and truly what it comes down to is because here's the thing. The military just made some policy changes. So in February 2018, 
uh, the Trump administration put out a policy, which was the deploy or get out policy, which said if you are not deployable, so deployment eligible uh, mm-hmm. within 12 months, then you were to be administratively discharged. Then I think what happened, though, is they said, oh, crap, there's a lot of people who aren't deployable, like technically deployable. So they came out with a memo and a new uh, a memo and a DOTI. So a DOTI is what's it's called the Department of Defense Instruction. It's what we have to live by at the Department of Defense level. How to handle people who are not deployable based on this deployer get out policy. Because the deployer get out policy really and truly in and of itself wasn't meant to kick people out. It was what we call malingerers. And it was more so hit at people who were like, their PT test comes around, you know, they take their PT test twice a year because they don't hit the 90% or higher threshold. So their PT test comes around and they're like, ooh, my back hurts. Let me go talk to the doctor. And then they get put on profile. So they can't. So when they get put on profile for like three months, well, they're, they're, they don't take their PT test for three months. They don't, they're, they're limited to PT. They're, they don't even, they can't deploy. And so there are people like that still everywhere in society, but they're in, of course, there are people like that in the military and they just draw a paycheck. So it was more aimed at those kind of people, but at the end of the day, it's still like, it kind of hit everyone. So that, that Dodie then came out and said, hey, this is how we're actually going to handle, deal with people. And then there was a memo that was published, and I'll read it to you. There was a memo that's, that read, it came out from the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, and it was, it was postmarked on June the 6th of 2018. And it's a memorandum for the Air Force Personnel Center, which is down at Lackland. Um, It's also down, it was also given for the Air Force Medical Standards Branch. The Air Force Medical Standards Branch is the one who determines whether or not a member with a certain condition is going to go to a medical board and go through the whole process. And they said, this memo will provide guidance for the Air Force Personnel Center Medical Standards Branch in the Medical Service Officer Management Division for the evaluation for fitness for airmen with asymptomatic HIV. In order to treat every airman equitably and with dignity and respect, the appropriate treatment and medical evaluation of fitness for continued service for asymptomatic HIV airmen will be accomplished in the same manner as any airman with a chronic and or progressive disease in accordance with the DOTI 6485.01, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, human immunodeficiency virus in military service members dated back to 2013. Asymptomatic HIV alone is not unfitting for continued service. That's the biggest, that's my biggest issue I've got is because you've got an, you've got a DOTI which states that symptomatic HIV alone is not unfitting for continued service. You've got an official memo dated June 6th of 2018, which states asymptomatic HIV alone is not unfitting for continued service. You've got an, a, you've got an AFI, Air Force instruction. It's the instructions that Air Force members are to live by. It's from Dr. O. Coolidge, who is the chief infectious disease, disease doc for HIV. The AFI he wrote also says asymptomatic HIV alone is not unfitting for continued service. But yet the Air Force is saying, if you've got HIV, we're kicking you out. So where's the disconnect? Where Where is that breakdown happening where this stuff isn't? Who's basically deciding, okay, yes, we have all this stuff over here that says it shouldn't be an issue, but now we're going to discharge people. I don't know. That's honestly the biggest question everyone's trying to ask. No one knows No one knows why. No one knows where this this, this is happening. Who's initiating the whole process of like reviewing you? Like who flagged you? So I was diagnosed on December the 7th. Then about a week later, I got a phone 2018? call. 2018? Yeah. So then I got a phone call about a week later from a guy named Walter Micah. He's a guy that is the community health nurse down at the infectious disease clinic at the Brooke Army Medical Center. You can also call it San Antonio Military Medical Center. If you're diagnosed with HIV in the military, you have to go down to see the ID doc for an initial visit. They check your blood work. They check a lot of different things. You go through classes, just about essentially how to deal with living with HIV. And honestly, I think it's really awesome. I think the military honestly does a better job at dealing with HIV than the civilian side. It's just because the military is so structured and rigid that you have to do it anyway. So once I left San Antonio and came back out to California and back to my job, about a week later, I got a phone call from my military rep from the medical board that said, hey, what they call the Air Force Medical Clearance Board, has looked at your case and said you're, you're, they recommend a return to duty. 
From there, it goes to the medical standards branch. The medical standards is the one who says you're going to be returned to duty and you're fine or you're returned to duty with a, an assignment limitation code or some kind of limitation. Or they can say push it into what we call IDES. It's the informal disability process. It's the informal disability evaluation system. But that medical board process. Um, and so it all starts at the medical standards branch. It works its way through. But the problem is it, there seems to be a disconnect. It kind of, in my opinion, there's, and this is my opinion and not an opinion of the Air Force, the, the U.S. government or anything. But my opinion is this. There's a there's a, some kind of disconnect at the medical standards branch. There's some kind of disconnect at the, at the, at the medical board. And there's also some kind of disconnect at the secretary of the Air Force level. Because my, my thing is if I, as a military member, have to follow DOTI's official memos, orders, AFIs, then why shouldn't everyone else have to? And that's precisely why there are lawsuits against, honestly, that's, that's why there are lawsuits at the, 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 the level that they're at right now. There's, you know, like they're, they're fighting for the fact that, hey, this is what the DOTI and memo and AFI say, but here's my discharge notice, which states you're being discharged, medically discharged because of HIV. And that's the only thing that they're being discharged for. I mean, it sounds like the fact that these lawsuits are happening is necessary and it might be like the catalyst that finally gets everyone on the same page. That's what I hope for. Is there anything that has like transpired or come up in the last week? You've been getting information and things have changed here and there like almost daily. So I don't... When I got the phone call that I was going to be going through the full medical board process, um, I sprung into action because I was like, heck no. I'm not going to be, you know, found unfit. I mean, heck, here I am as a kid who does CrossFit. I'm training for a marathon, like my ninth marathon. Like, you know, all these things. I'm a very, I'm a very, I eat healthy. Like, I'm just, I eat healthy. I'm just a, I'm a very fit person. I run 26 miles for fun. Like. And your, um, what's your rank? What do you do in the Air Force? I'm a second lieutenant. Um, I am a logistics officer. There's a lot. So you've, I mean, you've obviously like earned this position yourself through your merits in. I mean, I, it, I'll tell you, like, it didn't come without a lot of hard work because, uh, you know, I went to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. It's one of the four federal service academies. You've got West Point um, for the, the Army. You've got Annapolis Naval Academy in uh, Maryland for the Navy in the Marine Corps. You've got the Coast Guard Academy. Um, for the Coast Guard, and you got the Air Force Academy for the Air Force. There are a few ways to commission, but that's, in my opinion, one of the, how shall I say, hardest, crappiest ways to do it. It's just because every day is, you're having to do something and, and you're having to work hard every day just to get through. And, you know, the way that translates into now is I didn't, I didn't work hard every day at the Academy for four years, 26 June of 2014 to 23 May of 2018. I didn't suffer in some way, shape, or form every day to get here and just give up, you know? I don't know. That's 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 why I've decided to fight. That's why I decided that I'm not just going to lay down because I do think it's imperative that the stigma of HIV changes because the problem, I think, really, with where this disconnect comes from is stigma because, you know, I've heard, I've heard stories where you've got people – who freak out because they've got a subordinate who has HIV and you know they get counseled right they have they have doctors call them and talk to them and they say hey this person is completely fine and they're like well he's going to give it to somebody else and they're like his viral load is zero he could literally cut your arm and you could cut like cut his <laughs> and he's not going to pass it to you and it's like, you know, and it come and he's like, well, HIV. So I think that's the biggest problem we've got, we're still facing in today is that even people that are living with HIV, like you and I, they still feel ashamed that they have HIV. They don't want to talk about the fact they've got HIV. They don't want to. Also, I think, I can't assume, but I would imagine that HIV is still so much associated with LGBT, mainly gay men. So yeah. that's also carries that stigma as well. And it wasn't that long ago where gay and lesbian service members could be open. So I'm sure there's still that stigma and then wrap that up into this disease, this virus, 
and it just like doubles down on that fear and the irrational bias. I will say on the good front though, aside from the Air Force, I know that the Navy and the Army are actually making some really good progress. The like the Navy just said that they have there has been discussion about letting sailors go back out to sea on ships without getting a waiver, which is kind of a big deal. Because when you're on a ship, you're considered like deployed. They wouldn't even let you be on a ship. And then they opened up to the point where it's like, okay, well, you can have a waiver. And that's still kind of a hard process. But now there, there's even discussion of not even needing a waiver to get back on a ship. That's, that's, that's big progress. It was out in the news recently too, which I think is incredible. The Army um, is also now about to begin allowing soldiers in infantry units to deploy downrange with their infantry units. Now they can't actually be in combat, but they can be. They can still deploy with their infantry unit, um, but be in like a supporting role. What does that mean, downrange? Like deployed in a combat environment. So that's that's pretty big too. That they're gonna actually allow HIV soldiers to deploy with their infantry unit. Albert, they're not gonna be in their unit actually shooting people but they're still going to be in downrange with them in a supporting role but i can imagine like being someone in that position and all the literal blood sweat and tears you put into doing what you have to do and then like these guys are your family and you've bonded with them so intimately and then to be told that you can't go out and serve with, alongside them has got to be like soul crushing i'm sure that's such a huge deal for those guys to be able to at least be out there with them supporting. So I definitely agree with that. I mean, I've heard two sides of the argument that, man, like this is great, you know, because it's a big step in the right direction. But I've also heard some soldiers be like, well, man, that still kind of sucks, you know, because it's like, I trained for a job, I wanted to be out with them. But I look at it as okay, like, you know, we're still moving in the right direction. We're still moving in the right direction. Yeah, that's all we can ask for, really. The Air Force needs to catch up. That's, I'm sitting here thinking, man, like, I joined the Air Force because you always hear the jokes, you know, about the different branches and you always hear in the Army, don't join the, join the Air Force if you want like a good life. Those are all the jokes you always hear. It's just the most bougie, you know, and, and then to get here and realize, man, like, why are the heck are the other branches making progress and we're not? Because that what doesn't make sense to me is that we historically have been the most progressive match, branch of the military medically in regards specifically to HIV, but it's like, now we're like, I don't know, it's like we're almost regressing while everyone else is progressing. All we can wait for is to see what happens with the lawsuits. Do you know when those started? Was it last sometime? year? Yeah, sometime in the middle of the, like mid-December. What's the, what's, so what's the next step for you? Are you waiting until, was it March or April? Yeah, the next step for me is going through all the, um, the medical visits I've got to do for the veterans. Um, affairs so that I can um, have a disability packet actually stamped by a doctor so that it, when it so because the way that works is like when all when all the medical records get sent to the informal board the VA also has the, the medical records for for me from the military side but also from the side of the house where in the next few weeks I'll be going to different like appointments to get checked on by a civilian doctor um, for things, you know, like I broke my foot when I was at the academy. So, okay, are there any lingering issues because I broke my foot? If there are, okay, cool, that's going to be like claimed on my, you know, veterans benefits. Do I have back problems or neck problems or, you know, anything? They'll, they'll check for anything that's, so it's pretty extensive, but it's good because they try to make sure that you get the most up to date and most things on your disability status really and truly it would be great if i could just get a return to duty right away you know from the from board but on the on a bright side though i've uh i've got you know you always want to have a plan b in, in the event that um life surprises you uh, i'm looking at like honestly probably selling all my possessions and just taking whatever the va gives me um if i if once i if i fight all the way and i do still get discharged just uh cutting everything selling everything I have except for the few minor things and going and like teaching English as a, English as a second language in Southeast Asia. Yeah, I'm young and my boyfriend is young. We're both young. Like we're both on the, we're both on the point that we want. Like we've always talked about going to Vietnam or China or whatever to teach English as a second language. Um, but I am starting something soon though. Um, you know, when you're diagnosed with HIV, you have to, aside from taking your medication, they do recommend that you take care of your health on a 
better level, eat, eating better, you know, watching your sugar intake. I'm going to start a, I'm actually going to start a nonprofit here. Um, I've been working with a, another friend of mine. We're going to start a nonprofit. It's going to be um, endurance athletes for HIV. So they've done a lot of studies in that, that, that show that um, endurance athletes, whether you be a triathlete or, a, you know, a cyclist, marathon runner, whatever, their body actually responds better as a, a person living with HIV. Like, for example, back in the late 90s when, you know, medicine, medicine for HIV was like a cocktail of like 20 pills a day, you know, and um, the, 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 the medicine was still real toxic and stuff. You know, there are stories out there of people that were like going out and still doing crazy things like doing Ironmans and their bodies have responded what they, their bodies responded well. So uh, what I, what I think is really, what I think really is really awesome about that is, you know, I'm a big proponent of running cause it's what I do most. That's what I do most. Um, and I have a love hate relationship with a book that's called born to run. Um, but I really am truly of the opinion that we were as a people, as humans, were born to run. And that's because you see it in African cult, like African tribes, indigenous tribes around the world. Um, the most studied tribe is the Tarahumara tribe in northwestern Mexico. I mean, you literally, they literally run to exhaust their prey. And so I'm of the opinion that there's a reason that if we take care of our bodies and kind of live the way that our bodies were designed to be treated and, and live the way you're supposed to live, that our body will just work in better harmony. And so I think that a, as a person living with HIV, already having to, just as a normal person, should be eating right and, and exercising. But now you have this chronic condition, so now you really kind of truly should be living right. And I think there's a reason that endurance athletes tend to fare better on ARVs because of how they're living. So that's why we're starting that nonprofit. So it's going to be endurance athletes for HIV. One of the goals I have for this nonprofit is, yeah, we're going to raise, we're going to raise money for, you know, HIV research campaign, but it's also going to provide a, it's going to provide a network for HIV members who are already athletes like myself, or maybe who are guys that have been recently diagnosed or have been diagnosed for a while, but they, they're, they've all just kind of seen well, can I be, can I run a marathon? Can I run a half marathon? I get questions like that all the time and about bodybuilding too. And like, that's one thing most people's doctors, when they get diagnosed, will tell them, okay, eat right, be healthy, blah, 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 go off into the world. And people are like, okay. So I think that's so awesome. Cause then you're going to have this outline of, of what to do next. And a, a whole community of people who are like, we've been there. We know what to do. We're going to help you. We're going to guide you. I think that's freaking awesome. But I, th but there's also that transition of, okay, when the doctor tells you, like on December the seventh, when the doc said, "Hey, I already know you're healthy, but like just keep doing your keep doing you and eat right, and exercise." All right, cool. Okay, well, to a person who doesn't truly know what they're doing, they're gonna be like, "Well, crap. What does that mean?" Quite frankly, you know, this there's a lot of misinformation that happens on Google. I typed in, "Is marathon running good for your body?" and you get all these mixed messages. Oh yeah, it's great, and then you get all these horrible things like. No, you're going to be dead by the time you're 50. And then like, you know, and then the worst thing I hate the most is like, I actually had someone ask me this question yesterday and then like, and he was like, well, how are your knees feeling? And that's the worst question I hate getting asked because so, you know, think about all these kind of things that you have in your mind. Right. And then imagine now being diagnosed with HIV and then the doctor says, Hey, go eat right. Hey, go exercise. And then maybe in the back of their mind, they're thinking they, they've always kind of toyed with the idea of, yeah, I'd like to run a half, mar like a half marathon or a marathon. And then you go on Google and you're like, is marathon running good for you? The kind of the whole goal of this kind of this, this endurance athletes for HIV is going to be providing a network to where you can connect with people that are living with HIV that are, you know, new to the, the endurance athletics world that have been doing this thing for a long time or, you know, in all in between. And then it's going to, we're also going to provide you. So you're going to have that connection with people, that human face-to-face -face interaction, online interaction, however you, however, wherever you are. And also you're going to have access to people who are coaches who can help you get to a spot where you are comfortable to help you get to a place, you know, injury free to help you get to a race that you want to do. And also help have have like outlines of, hey, this is how you should take care of your body anyway through 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 healthy eating. Okay, but here are like extra requirements you might want to you're gonna have to think about now that you are 
training for an endurance event. You are an endurance athlete, that you're eating healthy, but you also have HIV. So here are a few extra things you might want to think about too. So just providing an opportunity for people to say, let me live my best life. 